Okay, so we just had a talk about science. And the difference between philosophy and science, the, the main difference, is that philosophy does not deal in objectively measurable phenomena the way science does. So science can, as it keeps improving its measurement techniques, it makes previous scientific theories obsolete. That doesn't happen in philosophy. Philosophy, the way we measure things is subjectively, and that hasn't changed. So the 20th century philosopher Alfred North Whitehead said that the entire Western philosophy, the entire history of Western philosophy, can be regarded as a series of footnotes to Plato, who was the first philosopher whose works we, we have in any detail. Now, if, if you look at Plato, you find that he deals with every issue that modern philosophy deals with. Uh, and he seems to see all the points of view, except his, the one that he chooses isn't necessarily the one that other people will choose. Except, with one exception, he does not discuss freedom of will. Uh, he does talk about, in, a, in the Republic, he talks, says that we're free to choose our next life in all of its details. So in some sense, we're free but he never explains how that's possible or what it involves. His student Aristotle went a little further. Aristotle is trying to decide what is a, a free act. And he imagines an objector saying, everything that we desire, we desire because it seems good to us, but we can't choose what's good, what looks good to us. We have no control over what looks good to us. So we really, we really can't help what we choose. It depends on our character and we can't change our character, at least not in the moment. And Aristotle's reply to this is, well, if this is the case, then there is no real freedom in our actions. If there is freedom, then in some sense we must be responsible for our character. And he just leaves it at that. Um, that view, the view that he raises via an objector, is what's called hard determinism. Hard determinism is the view that everything that we decide is determined, and because it's, decided, because it's determined, we have no responsibility for it. Now, a later philosopher, Lucretius, an Epicurean, <coughs> Who lived, about, uh, who lived in the first century BCE was an atomist. He believed everything was made up of atoms, including our soul. And the atoms bump into each other, and everything happens as a result of collision of atoms. So what does this have to say for freedom of the will? It sounds, sounds like a determinist. But he doesn't like the idea of freedom of the will, so he says, there must be an ability of the atoms of our soul to swerve spontaneously out of their trajectories. And so we do something that isn't simply caused by what happened before. And that's a curiously prescient of the modern physics view, the quantum indeterminacy view, that things at, the, at a certain level, things happen without any reason, without any cause purely spontaneously. Now that view is the second of the three major views on freedom of the will, that's indeterminism, that things are in fact not determined. The third we can see in a philosopher who came about 100 years later, the first century uh, CE, and that's Marcus Aurelius, the emperor of Rome and one of the great Stoic philosophers. And Marcus Aurelius uh, is sort of curious. It seems as if he's contradicting himself at first. Because he says, he keeps saying to himself, his book is called The Meditations, but its original title is To Myself. And he keeps saying to himself, you're free. You, you, so why don't, you, why don't you become a good man? Nothing's stopping you. 
You're free to become one, so become one. And he keeps talking about how he's free and not living up to what he thinks he ought to be doing. But when he talks about other people, he says, we should be forgiving of other people because they really can't help what they do. Because what they do, what seems to them to be the right thing to do, and this sounds like Aristotle's objector, what seems to them to be the right thing to do is what's in accordance with their character, and they can't help that. So how do you reconcile those two sides of, of Aurelius, the one that says, we're free, I'm free, and the one that says, you're not, and therefore I have to forgive you. And that view is what's come to be called compatibilism. That is, that there is a sense in which the will is free that is also compatible with causal determinism. Now, how that works is something that I'll come to, but I wanted to mention these people because it gives us the three basic postures on, on the question of free will. Hard determinism, indeterminism, and compatibilism. Now, none of these people discuss free will in any detail. The first person who really does that is Plotinus, a, a, um, a Neoplatonist philosopher who lived in the third century CE. And I think the reason that he is the first one who thinks this is worth discussing in detail may be because he was acquainted with early Christian theologians. And in fact, freedom of the will first becomes a really central issue in philosophy with Christian theology. Part of it is, of course, the question of salvation and punishment and sin. Um, would a just God punish us if we're not free, if our actions are somehow determined? Would reward or punishment be justified then? But I think a stronger reason for that, because you could say that about the justice system in ancient Greece as well, a stronger reason, I think, is God's omniscience. God knows what you're going to do before you do it. So you're sitting there stressing out saying yes, no, you're an idiot, and going back and forth. And God, meanwhile, is, is looking at the next moment and already knows what you're going to do while you're, you're going through all this terrible turmoil. Uh, and so if God knows what you're going to do before you do it, how are you free? There's only one choice you can make, namely the one that God already sees. So that's why I think it becomes an issue, starts to become a big issue with Christianity. So I'd like to begin with that question. Um, how are we free if God knows what we're gonna do before we do it, what we're gonna choose before we choose it? And you don't have to believe in God, you can believe in physics. According to physics, there were four dimensions. Height, width, breadth, and time. Now, but we're three-dimensional creatures. So I can look around and I can see every point in the height of the building. I can see every point in the width. I can see every point in the depth. But I can only experience one moment of time. I can't see the other moments of time. But we're also told by physics that all of time exists. We, as three-dimensional beings, can't know this, but all of time exists at once that there are wormholes in the fabric of space-time that connect the future with the present, with the past. It's all there. And a fourth dimensional being would be able to see every moment of time the way we three dimensional beings can see every moment of height, width, and depth. So even if you don't believe in God, if you believe in physics, it's theoretically possible that a fourth dimensional being sees what you're going to choose before you choose it. So are you free in that case? Well, here Christian theology comes to the rescue. Uh, Saint Augustine, the fourth century founder of, of uh, Christian theology really, more than anyone else, and he raises that question, not of course with regard to the fourth dimension, but with regard to God's omniscience. 
And his answer is a very simple and I think very persuasive one. The fact that somebody knows what you're going to do doesn't force you to do it. God may know what you're going to choose, but that's only because God can see you making that choice in the future. God's knowledge does not determine your action. So you're not limited by God's omniscience. So the answer to our first question, how can we be free if God already knows what we're going to do, is that there's no problem that God's knowledge doesn't interfere with our freedom. The second question I want to ask, how can we be free if every event has a cause? Which means that my choices have causes, which means that everything is determined. So suppose I ask you, why did you, why did you come here today? And you're going to say, because there was nothing good on television. Now I know why you're laughing, because there's always something good on television. <laughs> but you know, we can, if we can believe in Santa Claus, we can believe in this example, at least for the sake of argument. So why do you think there's nothing good on television? Because you have certain tastes, and because the programmers made certain decisions. And the decisions the progr programmers made don't coincide with your tastes. So why do you have those tastes? Well, you have those tastes because of your experiences in life. You have those tastes because of your heredity. You have those tastes because of your environment, peer pressure, and so on. Um, and those, in turn, are caused by other things. And those causes are caused by other things. And so on, back and back. And eventually, the chain of causality starts at the beginning of time. The programmers who are making their decisions about what to choose for your programming today, they too are determined by their tastes, by their beliefs about what people want, by their environment, by peer pressure, by their heredity. And each of these has causes. And each of those causes has causes. And so there, too, everything eventually goes back to the beginning of time. So ultimately, all of our choices on this view begin with the, with the initial state of the universe. Given the initial state of the universe, everything follows, including every decision that anybody ever makes. So let's look, in, let's look at this more closely. There are three factors involved when we make decisions. One is the available options. Two is our tastes. Three is the reasoning process by which we arrive at our decision. So let's take the first one, our options. There's a book by William Faulkner called As I Lay Dying. And in this book, a family is trying to get across a river. But the bridge is washed out. And so the brothers are debating, should we do this, should we do that? And they keep asking the father, what do you think, dad? And the father keeps saying, if only the bridge was still there, we could just ride right across it. And that's all he ever contributes to the debate. Uh, but that's not how things work. We don't have that option. The options we have are the options we have. We can't say if only. That doesn't really help anything. So the options are already set. We have no, there's no free will, no freedom to change our options. Well, what about our tastes? If Suppose you go to get ice cream, and you love chocolate ice cream, and you say, I'll have chocolate ice cream, and the, the server says, sorry, we only have vanilla. And you say, but that's terrible. I love chocolate ice cream, but I hate vanilla ice cream. And she says, that's no problem. Why don't you just decide to love vanilla ice cream and hate chocolate ice cream? Then, then everything will be fine. Well, we can't do that. We can't change our preferences. What, what seems good to us, what seems desirable to us, 
we can't help that. It's based on our character. So that leaves the third possibility, and that is the reasoning process. So somebody can say to you, I think you should think about this some more. And that's something that can change. The options don't change. Your tastes don't change, at least not in the immediate moment. But you can change your reasoning process. So what do you do when you think about it some more? It means that you stop reacting to immediate gratification. That's what the person means when they say, think about it some more, that you just you're too focused on your immediate gratification, you have to think more about the long-term consequences of what you're choosing. And so when you think about the long-term consequences, things look different. Um, you can realize that the things that stir you up right now are things which will not keep you happy for long and will have consequences, unpleasant consequences later on. So in your decision to resist the temptation of reacting to the things that stir you up, in your decision to instead focus on what will bring you long-range happiness, what you're doing is asking yourself, what do I really want? And you're doing then, if you do take the time to think about it, think it through, you're doing what you really want. And this doing what you really want is, is doing something freely. It's free will because it's what you really want. And this is the compatibilistic view. You're saying, okay, I agree that everything happens by causal determination. But at the same time, I can be free from the pull of what stirs me up. I can be free from irrational behavior. And this is a sense of freedom which is compatible with determinism. So that's what compatibilism is. Now let's take a third question. How can we be free, or let me, put it, let me put that differently. Can we be free if there is no causal determination? Is it possible to make a case for saying we're free because like the atoms that swerve according to Lucretius, or the indeterminate events according to quantum theory? Can these provide us, a base, provide us with a basis for freedom? Because they prove that things can happen spontaneously. Or well, if not prove, at least they illustrate that things could happen spontaneously. So let, let's consider some examples of that. So you're back to your ice cream place. And you say, and, and, and as, as you already know, you love chocolate ice cream. Um, and the other ice creams there look pretty disgusting. Uh, they have things like spinach ice cream. <laughs> and you hate spinach. And you say to the, you go up there, and the guy says, oh, I remember you. You're the guy that really loves chocolate ice cream. Well, you're in luck. Today, we have the finest chocolate ice cream in the history of the world. It's just been voted on by a, a panel of a million experts, and they all agree that this is the best chocolate ice cream anybody has ever made. Not only that, today it's half price. And not only that, but since you would be the 100th person, person to buy it today, you would get a free Cadillac automobile. And you say, I'll have the spinach ice cream and lots of it. Why do you say that? No reason. Because it's an uncaused event. There's no explanation. It's a spontaneous event. 
if there were a reason, then there would be a cause, and then our model that this is something that happens without a cause wouldn't work. So, so if you have uncaused events, there's no explanation to why they happen. You can't give a reason for them. You can't even say, well, he did it just to show he was free and didn't have to do what people expected of him. But that would be a reason, too. And that, therefore, that would be a cause of the decision. And so this model rules that out also. There's no reason at all. The person just says, I'll have the spinach ice cream, which they hate. But there's no reason, that, there's nothing improbable about that because it's happened for no reason. Let me give you another example. You're with your sweetheart. It's a perfect day. The sweetheart, your sweetheart is the perfect person. It's, what, it's the person that you've always been looking for, and it's perfect in every way. And your sweetheart looks you deeply in the eyes and says, I love you. And you look your sweetheart deeply in the eyes and you say, you smell like a warthog. <laughs> and you look like one, too. Well, why do you do that? Well, no reason. It's an uncaused event. So what these examples are meant to illustrate is that if there is such a thing as an undetermined world where things happen spontaneously for no cause at all, that's not really what we would think of as a meaningful sense of freedom. That would be random chance. That wouldn't be a good thing. Maybe, you know, maybe it's freedom, but it's freedom from yourself in a way. It's freedom from your own preferences. It's just a free-floating event. And there's nothing that would be very desirable about that. So that's the third question. That is the question of Can there be a meaningful sense of freedom through indeterminacy, events that are not at all determined? I have one last question that I want to put, and that is, can we be responsible for our actions if we don't have free will? So this goes back to one of the questions I asked in connection with theology earlier. Uh, can you be held responsible for your actions if all of your actions are the products of causes that go back to the beginning of the universe and you have no way of changing them? Well, you can change them, but only in accordance with your preferences. So that's another causal factor. Um, if you can't help doing what you do in the way, for example, that Marcus Aurelius said, If everything that you do is determined by causes, then how are you responsible for it? In a way, that's the question that Aristotle's objector raised as well. And the answer, we've seen it to some extent already. It's put most effectively, I think, by David Hume. And what David Hume points out is, is this. Um, people say that you shouldn't be held responsible for events if they follow from causes that you can't control. And he says, well, this means they will follow, follow from your character. But that's, in fact, what makes you responsible for them, the fact that they do follow from your character. Imagine if events didn't follow from your character. This would be like the kinds of examples I gave before. If events didn't follow from your character, then you'd do one thing one minute, something completely unrelated and incompatible with that the next minute. Your behavior would be all over the place. You would simply be irresponsible because all of your choices would be entirely free-floating. They would have nothing to do with who you are. So that wouldn't be a good thing. And that wouldn't be responsib responsibility. And if you get to the other question, then how can we punish people 
for doing what they can't help doing. Hume's point, and again, this ties in with things we've already talked about, is that why else would you punish them? You punish somebody for what happens from their character. If it doesn't come from their character, there's no point in punishing them because the next time they act may be completely inconsistent. You punish them because you think that there's a consistent character behind these actions which needs to be reformed. Otherwise, it makes no sense. And furthermore, when you punish someone or when you reward someone, what's the purpose? The purpose is to change their behavior. Uh, if you reward someone, it's to change their behavior to be more consistently like what they've already just done. If you punish somebody, it's to get them to be different in the next time. Now, the only way reward and punishment make any sense is if they have an influence on your behavior. And the only way they can have an influence on your behavior is if they have a causal effect on your character, or at least the choices you make. So as Hume points out, the only thing that really makes sense is to punish people if there is determinism and reward people if there is determinism. Determinism gives us a reason to punish and reward, not a reason not to punish and reward. So Hume is not a hard determinist. He believes in determinism, but he doesn't believe that determinism is incompatible with but determinism makes the question of responsibility impossible. Now I'd like to conclude with a reference to the title, What is Free Will Free From? There are three basic answers to that question. One is that free will is free from compulsion. That is, you're free when you're not forced to do something. So you know the Godfather movie. I'll make you an offer that you can't refuse. And what's the offer? Well, in 30 seconds, either your signature will be on that paper or your brains will be on that paper. That's not a free choice then. That's an act of, you're being compelled. But we have lots of, most of our choices are free in that sense. That is free from compulsion. All of us who are here today came here from our, of our own free will. Uh, well, I don't know, some people might have dragged their, their friends along, but um, at least most of us are here of our own free will, meaning that nobody compels us to do this. A second thing that free will can be free from, in theory, is causality. We, when we speak about free will, we might mean free from causality. We've already rejected that, though. That is, there is causality. If we were free from it, it would mean these acts of spontaneity that don't really seem to be something that, that, that are desirable. So free will in that sense is something that I've rejected. It, it, if, it do, if it does exist, it's at least not a good thing. And as far as we know, it doesn't exist because as far as we can tell, every event does have a cause. Third, we can be free from irresponsible behavior or irrational behavior. And that's something that we can certainly be free from. That is, in the example I gave before when someone said, I think you need to think about this some more, what they were saying was you need to be more rational. You need to free yourself from a kind of uh, re reflexive response to the stimuli of your emotions. And so we can be, f the more rational we are, in the sense of the more we think about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and whether it's what we really want, and whether it'll get us what we really want, the more we do that, the more free we are, because the more we are choosing what we really want. And yet that is at the same time 
something that's com compatible with the belief that every event has a cause. And so that is compatibilism, that we're free in the sense of free to be, of being reasonable, free from being irrational, uh, but we're not free from, cause, from causality. So ultimately, the view that I'm recommending to you is compatibilism. Thank you.